From ancient times to Hollywood, the sword has represented power, justice, and the fight against evil. It's both magical and deadly. The sword has influenced the outcome of great moments in history, inspired famous myths and legends, and the skill of its makers has turned it into an object of desire. It's a perfect fusion of form and function, and it has the power to thrill and appall in equal measure. Today, there are many reminders of our sword-fighting past. A man buttons his coat left over right, leaving his right hand free to draw his sword. We shake hands to show we're not armed. A gentleman escorts a lady by the right arm because his sword hangs on his left. With a touch of a sword, a man is knighted. With a breaking of his own, he is disgraced. Whole armies were surrendered by the giving up of a single sword. And swords have been ritually sacrificed to the gods in order to invoke their protection. Compared to many wild animals, we're defenseless creatures. So from the earliest times, we've had to make weapons that cut and pierce in order to hunt, to eat, and for defense against enemies. The first weapons were made of flint, honed by flaking, using antler or bone to create a good cutting edge. The first known metal was gold, but it's always been precious and usually belonged to royalty. The first metal to be used for making tools and weapons was discovered 6,000 years ago. That was copper. This is the great Orm copper mine in North Wales. It was one of the largest industrial centers of antiquity. Around 3,500 years ago, copper was exported from here to Northern Europe and the Mediterranean. A copper sword was a top of the range weapon, but it had its drawbacks. Copper is soft, but when it's mixed with tin, it becomes bronze. Bronze is three times stronger than copper and is more suitable for casting. This enabled swords of a similar quality to be produced in greater numbers. Those who control the production of bronze control their territory. In Cornwall, Neil Burridge, an expert bronze caster, has set up a forge in a Celtic roundhouse. He's heating up a mixture of approximately 90% copper and 10% tin to make bronze for a new blade. He makes bronze swords, like this 3,000-year-old example from the Royal Armouries in Leeds. This caster's technique is based on archaeological evidence. Like most sword makers, he judges the metal by eye, and the color of the molten bronze is crucial in deciding when it's ready to pour. It solidifies almost immediately. The famous legend of King Arthur and the sword in the stone may have its roots in this process, where we see the newly cast sword removed from a stone mold. Cooling the metal by quenching it in water also makes it harder and ready for action. The sword, unlike the spear or arrow, is a close-range weapon. That's what makes it so special, so personal and so terrible. In much of Northern Europe, the tribal system of fighting put great emphasis on individual bravery, but tactics and a coordinated approach to a battle were seldom adopted. But whatever system of fighting was used, there were still problems with swords. Bronze, though tougher than copper, could still deform in the intensity of a fight. <laughs> 
It took hundreds of years for new materials, knowledge and skill to cross the continent. With the discovery and exploitation of iron in 1500 BC in Central Asia, warriors had a harder material with which to make their weapons. The sword was still evolving along with metallurgy. Iron is much more abundant than copper and more widely distributed across the world. It could be forged into much sharper and more lethal weapons. Swords became longer and heavier, but few remain from the early iron period because they're prone to rust. Here's a rare example made in Western Europe. It shows a high level of decoration and may have been made as a gift for a tribal chief. Sword makers were highly regarded. Smiths who made instruments meant to take life and who transformed raw material seemed to have power over nature. So if you manipulated the four elements of earth, air, fire and water, you were empowered by the gods to manipulate a fifth element, magic. A swordsmith often worked in a forge whose entrance was shaped in a spiral to keep the light out. The colours of orange, red and white would be read by the sword maker like a special code. The blacksmith would work from these colours and he would work so that nobody could see what he was doing because he would be blocking it out. The only person that would have these secrets would be his son or his apprentice and they would be passed on and jealously guarded. Swords were thought to have spiritual powers beyond their earthly use and even went on to the afterlife. They were often buried with their owners in special places. There are many examples of Celtic graves where the warriors are dug up with their blades folded so that they can't be used, but if in the other world they needed them, the warriors could always unbend them. The sword was bent so that a mere mortal couldn't use it. The Celts invoked the power of lake goddesses to assist them in battle by giving up their swords as sacrificial offerings. When the Romans invaded Britain in 43 AD, they didn't underestimate the influence of the spirit world on their enemy. The strength and power of iron was exploited by the Romans more successfully than any other civilization. The Romans used new ideas and technologies to such advantage that they dominated the known world for centuries. The real essence of Roman success was discipline and collective skills. I mean, the Roman legionary fought as part of a team. He fought as part of a team which was well organised in tactical terms and had also got great logistic backup. I mean, he was a soldier rather than an individual warrior. And around the middle of the first century AD, the Roman soldier was to benefit from two significant changes in equipment. Bands of plate armor with mail and a sturdier cut and thrust sword made from steel. Both were very effective against their enemies. Romans trained hard. They even practiced with wooden swords, something that their dangerous entertainers, the gladiators, used to do. Here's some rarely seen footage of Hollywood actor Kirk Douglas in rehearsal for the epic film Spartacus, the story of a rebel gladiator. A motion picture unequaled in the entire history of filmmaking, unlikely ever to be surpassed. Slave, gladiator, invincible... Fighter. This film inspired Sue Shadrach, who's now an expert on gladiators. The whole word gladiator comes from the name for the sword. This is a gladius. Every gladiator takes their name from the, the primary weapon that they use. Gladiators have always pulled in the crowds. They were better trained than the average soldier. They were expensive, super pros, and some of their training was adopted by the Roman army. There are even accounts of female fighters. There were female gladiators, and they were by no means as common as the male variety, a novelty. And I think 
that because it was so shocking, it was a difficult thing for people to take in. But we have records of high-born women who chose to go into the arena. When we hear about these people, we've got to remember these women were the exception, very much the exception. In total, the Roman army had 30 legions of 5,000 men each. They also had as many auxiliary troops recruited from the subjects of the empire. With this, they conquered so many nations. So this was the thing that brought them their riches, their fame, their reputation. And it's always been the weapon that's defined Rome itself. When Emperor Claudius invaded Britain, he brought 40,000 troops with him, 15% of the entire army, and it took 20 difficult years to defeat the natives. The accounts of the terrifying fighting methods of the Celts were written up by the Roman scribe Tacitus. Each Briton behaved according to his character. Unarmed men were prepared to charge to certain death. Even the vanquished now and then recovered their fury and their courage. In their desperate plight, the enemy would show such bravery that when their front ranks had fallen, those immediately behind would stand on their bodies and continue to fight. This is Tacitus talking up the Celts to make the Romans look good. Despite the propaganda, there is no doubting the Celts' willingness to fight. But the Celts had to face the best sword in the business. The Romans adopted what really became the classic infantry short sword, double-edged, designed to be used by a partially armoured man fighting in rank and file. He didn't want to swing it very far, and ideally the Roman legionary was going to use it in combination with a, an oblong shield covering his left side, and he'd use it for the thrust. Uh, and some Roman swords have got specially hardened tips designed to cope with the opponents of Rome. A very, very effective fighting sword. Most of the Roman army were infantry. They used chariots for ceremonial and sporting events. Cavalry were only used for reconnaissance and harassing fleeing enemy soldiers. Mounted Roman troops didn't use stirrups, but that was to change. In 378 AD, two-thirds of the Eastern Roman army was wiped out by the Visigoths, who used the stirrup and massed cavalry charges. The introduction of the stirrup, which came in gradually from the east, made it easier for the very heavily armoured and equipped horseman to use his horse as a battle platform, with his feet thrust deeply into stirrups, um, riding with almost a straight leg and sitting in a, a great big chair-like saddle. There he was, secure in the saddle and able to use a variety of heavy swords and battle axes and war hammers, um, really comparatively securely. So from that point of view, the stirrup and the heavy sword went hand in hand. The Romans in Britain moved out to defend their territory in the east. Their western provinces then became vulnerable. Germanic and Scandinavian tribes invaded Britain. Jutes, Angles and Saxons settled amongst the newly Christianized British and overran most of the native population. These pagan invaders had to be resisted, and one of the greatest heroes of all time was created, Arthur, the once and future king, a figure that was part historical, part mythological. In the 12th century, Geoffrey of Monmouth took hold of the original Welsh myth and combined it with his own imagination to create a best-selling Latin text, The History of the Kings of Britain. The story spread into the French-speaking world, making Arthur and his knights the stuff of the European imagination, even rivaling heroes like Charlemagne. The early Celtic themes, such as the story in which Arthur proves his rightful succession as king by drawing the sword from the stone, are woven into the continental stories. <laughs> 
Later, English authors claimed that the sword from the stone was broken in combat by a Welsh knight, Pelinor. Arthur was saved from certain death by Merlin, who cast a spell on Pelinor. Soon after, Arthur, who had a regard for Pelinor's sword fighting skills, invited him to join the famous Round Table. Then Merlin took Arthur to a secret place where the Lady of the Lake magically presented him with a new sword. Arthur was told that his future would be bound to the sword for all the days of his life. This was Excalibur. Arthur was mortally wounded after the Battle of Camelon, and he instructed Sir Bedivere to return Excalibur to the lake. Bedivere was unable to part with the sword, fearing what the future held without Arthur and Excalibur. On the third attempt, he obeyed Arthur's wish and relinquished the sword. Excalibur is a classic example of the way that swords um, were used in myth and legend. The idea of a sword belonging to the once and future king uh, the idea of a sword which was not only important in that king's lifetime, but had, in a sense, to be committed back to whence it came. I think that's a very resonant idea, that, that the sword wasn't left behind after the great man had gone. The sword went after him so that when he reappeared in a time of great need, he'd have the mighty sword to hand. In the late 8th century, there was a new threat from the north. Vikings began to raid the coast of Britain and Western Europe. For the Viking, the sword was the principal weapon. Its value was considered so great that it was handed down from father to son. If the sword was old or belonged to a famous warrior from the past, then it would have even greater value. Magnus Sigurdsson, a swordsmith based in North Wales, makes historical weapons and knows about the qualities needed in a good blade. Steel is either hard and breaks or soft and bends. A sword actually needs to be hard to keep a good working edge. It also needs to be soft and pliable to actually take the shock of combat and sort of parrying and actually the physical force of a blow. So a sword is a contradiction in terms. <laughs> speaking in metal, which is why they were all so expensive and such hard work to make. Magnus is going to compare a Viking type of sword with one from the Bronze Age. We'll see how much difference over a thousand years of technological development has made to the cutting power of the weapons. The first to be tested is the Bronze Sword. This is 3,000 year old technology. Magnus is testing the sword on the carcass of a heifer. That's a nasty eight centimeters cut but it's not very deep. What we have here is a Viking style sword, 8th, 9th century, but the blade design carried on to the 13th, 14th century, primarily a slashing weapon. Thank you. The carcass is almost cut in two, proof that swords made from steel are more devastatingly effective than those made from earlier materials. Vikings revered their swords and gave them names like Grammar, Fierce One, Miofen, Decorated One, Futbeater, Biter of Legs. The Norsemen of northern France, the Normans, invaded England in 1066. Their Viking style swords were pattern welded from soft iron twisted with steel to make them both strong and flexible. The Normans took control of England and Wales. Within a hundred years, a new sword culture developed, one based on romantic notions. Inspired by the legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, the sword status was enhanced by the development of the chivalric code, a guide to acting with courage and honor which united knights across Europe. In the Middle Ages, the sword became particularly associated with the knight. Its Christian symbolism was also quite obvious. Uh, and the gesture of saluting by bringing the sword hilt to your lips, which is still done, really is a reflection of the age when the sword wasn't simply a knightly symbol, but reflected Christianity as well. The Crusades were seen as the pursuit of a pure ideal. 
They identified the knight as a virtuous champion, one who was destined to fight in wars as a soldier of the church. The Crusades were also a battle between the cross-shaped broadsword of Christianity and the crescent-shaped scimitar of Islam. The Royal Armoury is in Leeds as one of the finest sword collections in the world. It is the guardian of the British National Collection of Arms and Armour, and the museum is dedicated to the display and interpretation of military objects. The Royal Armoury also celebrates innovative design, fine craftsmanship, and advances in technology. Medieval smiths saw the transition from chainmail to plate armor as a response to developments in infantry weapons, such as mail piercing arrows. Shields, too, were gradually made redundant by full armor and began to disappear from the battlefield, at least for knights. By the late 14th century, a technical rivalry was developing between swordsmiths and armorers. Armour impacts on sword design just as the sword impacts on armour. Uh, what happens is that you have that classic two-way relationship between attack and defence. Um, to start with, um, chain armour or reinforced leather armour was widely used and that could often be penetrated by a sharp point which essentially wedged open the links in the uh, armourers responded by plate armour which was more difficult to penetrate so swords got heavier and swordsmith looked at producing robust blades with edges that might be able to work at places like the shoulders so armour got heavier so there's this two-way relationship with swordsmiths always thinking about getting through armour and armourers always looking at ways of defeating first the point and then the edge by the 15th century, plate armour was impressive to look at, but what was it like in action? At the Royal Armouries, there are international jousting events that put it to the test. Tournaments began as contests between teams of knights. Though there were casualties, the idea was not to spill much blood. It was meant to provide additional training for a knight, but the stakes were high. Knights on the losing side were taken as prisoners and ransomed. Fortunes could be made in this way. After jousting, knights would often continue fighting on foot. They used 200 great swords. At tournaments, a fixed number of blows would be agreed beforehand and knights would take it in turns to hit their opponent. The sword was used as a virtual club. On the battlefield, the two-handed sword was used to smash through armor. It looked heavier than it was, but nevertheless, it required considerable skill in action. Just how great a risk an armoured knight faced is answered by Dutchman Arne Koitz, who wears a mighty eagle helm in tournaments. Even if the visor is shut, you would try and stab through there with the sword, because it's a very big inroad into the brain. If the visor is open, so a knight can see more, then of course you have a bigger target. Depending on the type of helmet, the risk might be the front of the throat or the side of the neck. The armpits are very important. They are a main target. There's chainmail under there, but with a good thrust you can get through the mail and get into the lungs and the heart and other body parts. Ease of movement must be a problem. Plate armour does actually allow you a lot of movement. For example, you can raise your hands right up there. I can actually touch the far side of my head, and I can bring my arms right across. There are all sorts of moves you might use with a sword, too. The waist is actually made so that I can make a lot of movement, like this. <laughs> 
beweging houden. Dus ik kan bijvoorbeeld nog steeds. I can actually lunge with all this armor. The plates will fold and they'll concertina to allow me to do this. Ook de voeten. The sabotons on the feet, the knees, everything is articulated, even the top of the legs. This is to enable me to raise them because the movements involved are vital. Dus daar heb je eigenlijk alle bewegelijkheid die je nodig hebt om te kunnen vechten te voet. Face to face with the enemy was no picnic. What you then had was, in essence, bloody murder. You had two well-trained, heavily armoured men hacking at one another. So we ought not to confuse the knight's chivalrous background with the ghastly nature of what big men with big swords could actually do to one another. Medieval warfare involved butchery on a large scale. The sword was the knight's main weapon and it caused death from stabbing, bleeding, and infection too. Swords were rarely clean, and contaminated blades probably did as much damage as a sharp point. There are those today who still want to fight like medieval knights. In Hammerstein, North Germany, there's a unique sword fighting event, an international gathering of martial arts enthusiasts who come together to do battle in the style of the early 15th century. The contest is sponsored by Welsh company Knights Gone By. They supply weapons and costume for battle reenactment from all periods, but specialize in the Middle Ages. Some of the action is held at the local leisure centre. These fighters are using steel swords and small shields called bucklers. This is a competition, not a demonstration. This is tough stuff, but there have to be some safeguards. There was a level of risk tolerance and injury tolerance back then that we simply can't accept uh, nowadays. And the winner of the match was the one who struck his opponent and trying to inflict a bleeding wound. So when you have a culture that breeds fencers who are used to that level of, uh, of intensity of, of competition, um, you're going to see certain skill levels, I think, uh, that we're probably never going to attain. But in terms of getting close, as close as we can, in terms of actually carrying out the techniques in a combative situation and making them work, uh, I think we're getting pretty close to that. Judges are looking for a number of qualities that range from attitude to technique. They're primarily looking to see uh, a swordsman who uh, displays dominance over his opponent. And they're looking for a swordsman who can step in and strike his opponent a clean blow and then escape untouched. There's an old saying from, from fencing, and that it's, fencing is the art of touching without being touched. You are so focused on your opponent, watching every little move, planning out what you're going to do next, that there's no time for fear. It's a very delicate balance between being ready to go, ready to really snap into action, but have that under tight control until that exact moment when, bang, you step in and you strike your opponent. The event is partly based at Baron von Hammerstein's castle near Hanover, a gothic and inspirational setting for the contest. The fighters don't have a lot of protection from blows, but then they're not exactly trying to kill each other. When he's not judging at Hammerstein, Alex Kiermaier is chasing villains in Munich. He's a cop, but he's been interested in swords a long time. I've been keen on sword fighting since childhood, at least from the age of 10 years old through to my teenage years. Really, we just took sticks and fought wildly with no technique. I think this is the same all over the world. The competitors have an academic interest in swords. Yeah, I think this is one of the most important 
Dinge, die wir beachten müssen. The most important Aber thing we do is to look at historical sources. We don't want just to attack each other in a brutal way. Situation zusammenzustellen und nicht einfach nur die Schwerter aufeinander zu schlagen. Es fühlt sich einfach It feels good to use a sword correctly. Für mich steht es vor allem für Kontrolle. For me it's all about controlling my ego, controlling the opponents and the distance between us and not to lose my overall game plan. Kontrollieren und auch den Abstand zwischen uns. Some of the oldest manuscripts which illustrate sword fighting moves were produced in Germany. There are examples from the 13th century. They depict what appeared to be monks, but are probably ex-soldiers who had retired to monasteries and wanted to record their sword fighting skills. The man in armor is Frenchman Philippe Guillon, a martial arts expert who is also judging here. I've always been interested in martial arts, but medieval manuscripts have only been available for the last 10 or 12 years on the internet and other digital sources. There are guides available in Italian and German, and I'm studying the medieval master, Sigmund Ringek, who is from the longsword tradition. Medieval fencing is technically difficult. We can recreate it as closely as possible, but in an event like ours, emotions run high. The intense desire to compete sometimes gets in the way of correct sword fighting of the medieval period. They don't only use steel here, bamboo swords, some clad in black leather, also pack a punch. Some of the women pack a punch too. Iris Van Dam from Holland is keen to fight the men. Uh, it took me on because I, um, yeah, with the on the middle school, I had to. Sword fighting attracted me because in high school I had to choose performance art. Everybody did juggling and some even tried the monocycle. But I and a friend chose sword fighting. We found a place through the internet. We went along and met these guys. They had really long hair. They were big and scary, but they turned out to be really sweet. Sometimes it's difficult to fight someone who's stronger or got a better technique. But in training, things are gentler, and then it's not so dangerous. Here in competition, it's tougher, but I've got a good technique, and sometimes I win, but sometimes I lose. I don't always have the strength to keep my guard up. Would she consider modern fencing? In the beginning, I thought about fencing, but the skills are so different. For me, fencing is a bit weird. There's too much jumping back and then forwards. Also, fencing is more about thrusting than hitting your opponent hard. Whatever the protection, there's usually a way through, especially when the armor used isn't custom made. This competitor has just had his wrist cut open. The paramedic sorted him out in the end. In the finals, it was Israel versus Germany. The tall man in white is the Israeli. Alex Brenin from Israel took the long sword prize. I enjoy the fight. I enjoy the history too. It's uh, it has a long legacy. It's uh, and it's cool to have people just returning to their roots a little and not just doing katana and kenjutsu and Japanese things. We're European. We should do European things. The prize is a broadsword made and presented by Magnus Sigurdsson on behalf of the sponsors. Iron swords have always been desirable. This is an Italian sword called the Cinque Terre, so called because it's five fingers wide at the top of the blade. It's based on medieval types of swords that were used to lever open plate armor. <laughs> 
In the 16th century, they were used by Italians for adornment, often hung in a scabbard, slung along the lower back and buttocks. The quality of the steel in this example is not the finest. Some of the best swords of all time were produced in the Far East. For over a thousand years, one blade dominated the battlefields of Japan, the katana used by samurai warriors. This is where the legendary katana is born. This furnace will burn with by iron reduced to a sand-like form. The iron is incredibly pure and it forms a unique steel once it has combined with the carbon from the charcoal flakes. The raw steel is tamahagini. After an hour, the iron sand sinks to the bottom to the bed of fire. When we look at the bed of fire, we can see from the colour whether or not it has become tamahagini. The furnace man tends the flames day and night until the process is complete. The furnace is like a woman, and we can think of the iron and coal as food. We feed her, and she consumes it so that she will produce good tamahegani. The carbon provides shock absorption to withstand huge punishment when fighting. And the samurai, the, the warrior and gentleman of Japan, was defined by the two swords that he wore. He wore a long sword called the katana and a short sword called a wakizashi. And almost no one else in Japanese society was allowed to wear a sword. And so the wearing of a pair of swords became a way of advertising that you were a samurai that you were a man of a particular breeding, particular background. And the long sword, the katana, this gently curved, very simple blade, was more than simply one of the most effective fighting weapons ever designed. It was something that went to the very centre of the samurai ethos. It was, as it was put at the time, the soul of the samurai. After three days, the special tamahagani steel is drawn from the furnace. The swordsmith leads a spiritual way of life. He prays to Buddha for a perfect sword. The forge is regarded as a sacred site. In all countries with a martial tradition, the sword has been elevated to a symbol of power and justice. But in Japan, it's more than this. The samurai's spiritual development was achieved through the way of the sword. The tamahagani is covered in paper with the holy script. Then a light covering of clay and ash are added to limit the amount of air in the process. The hammering welds all the pieces into one and drives out impurities. The katana is now a block of steel, but then it is folded. A dozen folds creates over 5,000 layers of steel. In most cultures, the smith has an important role. I mean, he's the man who is putting into the sword more than simply practical qualities. He's imbuing it with something of himself. He, he will very often make the process of forging the sword quasi-religious. Um, he'll sign it with pride. Um, so much so that good swordsmiths often had their signatures counterfeited, almost like good artists might. In Japanese society, this takes a very extreme form, and the smith would abstain from drink and from sex and would almost become a monk for the period of forging the sword. And the sword would have in it all sorts of qualities, and it was said that a particularly famous Japanese swordsmith would always make swords that had a a particular thirst for blood. He was a skilled smith, but his swords somehow were evil. Samurai warriors were an elite class. Their particular Buddhist belief meant they had no fear of killing or dying. Raids on Korea and China gained riches for the warlords of medieval Japan. The katana sword brought wealth. It was a blade of distinction. With the Japanese sword, you have a, uh, a little irregular, wavy line at the edge, and that reflects the fact that actually it too 
is layer upon layer of steel, beaten, heated, beaten again, giving quite extraordinary strength and durability to the blade, but also sharpness at its cutting edge. Katanas were made from two kinds of steel, hard on the outside, but with a softer core to give toughness and flexibility. In the Middle Ages, katanas were used in executions, but they were also tested on the corpses of criminals. Swords were graded according to their cutting power. One of the final stages is the polishing process. The task is to sharpen the sword and to reveal the structures or grain that were built into the sword during the making process. Eventually, the beauty of the metal shines through and the hard and soft layers are revealed. The samurai was always close to his sword. At night, it remained by his bed. It was a sign of his authority, and only death would part him from it. But which is superior? The Japanese katana or a medieval broadsword from the same period? The katana is light and enables the swordsman to move and cut quickly. The broadsword is heavier, but just as sharp. By the time the katana has made three cuts, the broadsword will only cut once. This sword may be made today, but it embodies centuries of knowledge. While the samurai were at their most powerful, Europe was entering the Age of Enlightenment. In the West, the Renaissance of the 15th century brought about a new age of learning. Between 1450 and 1500, more books were produced than in the previous 1,000 years. The development of printing allowed experts to reach a wide audience. The publication of guides to sword fighting proved popular. It wasn't long before these ideas were exploited by the theatre. Shakespeare took his fencing seriously. There are over 400 references to swords in Shakespeare's plays. Stratford, the home of the Royal Shakespeare Company, regularly puts on the great bard's plays. Film and stage actor Matthew Rhys has played a lead role in several Shakespeare productions. Within the three productions that I did there, the three different styles of fighting were completely different. The Macbeth, for example, we used samurai swords. The Romeo was very true to its time. We used rapiers. And then the Edgar Edmund fight, we used broadswords. I think the true mark of a, a good fight arranger, fight director, is they, they will think how the characters would fight. Not, it's not just about devising a good fight, but how each individual character would fight. So Edmund, for example, who's very devious, sinister, had a very nasty style of fighting, cheating and underhand tactics, whereas, you know, Romeo the Romantic is upright and sort of beautiful footwork. Hollywood actor Johan Griffith, who starred as Lancelot in Touchstone Pictures' King Arthur, recalls his stage fight training. The, the swordmaster at, at Rada would always remind us that you, we were never in any sort of neutral pose whilst the sword had been withdrawn. You were always sort of on guard, as it were, you know, prepared. So there was never a moment where you would relax the sword in any way. Everything was, you know, had a focus and a purpose and, and being in a state of readiness, you know, to, to receive a parry or, uh, or get ready to, to riposte. Dangers must be considerable. It's very dangerous, as, uh, as, I, as I'm not sure if you can see, as I can prove, and that's with a blunt sword. <laughs> Actors in Shakespeare's time had to prove themselves to their audiences, who knew all about sword fighting. They would try to join in until swords were banned from the auditorium. 
Shakespeare enjoyed action as well as words, and so the Royal Shakespeare Company's creative workshops continue to design and restore the arms and armor essential to its production. Julian Gilbert, the company armorer, has been with the RSC for 25 years, and his sword collection is a favorite with fight directors. Weapons and props from this armory are not only seen on stage, but in the cinema too. Feature films like Gladiator, Braveheart and Elizabeth have used the Royal Shakespeare Company armory to equip its stars. Shakespeare's audiences craved violence. They knew all about bear baiting, bull baiting, cockfights and duels to the death. Actors, though, had to fence safely in order to do it nightly. Animal bladders would be filled with sheep's blood and squeezed to feign a wound. In his stores, Julian has many props to help tell a story. In the theater, just like film, sound is important in conveying authenticity. The swords on stage have to sound like the real thing. Yes, these are of um, the type that Matthew Rhys would have used in a production of Romeo and Juliet and King Lear. And this is an interesting one because it's made from an aluminium alloy and it sounds absolutely beautiful when struck. It's a really nice, nice ring. But unfortunately, you can't use the alloy sword against a steel sword. It has to be used against itself. Otherwise, the steel sword will literally cut straight through this alloy one. Shakespeare learned to fence in Blackfriars Theatre. He was taught by an Italian, Vincenzo Saviola. At the time, the sword was still the weapon of choice in a fight. The sword was soon to bow to a new and terrible weapon. Gunpowder had been invented by the Chinese in the 9th century and was originally used by the artillery. By the 16th century, it had been developed and used in handheld muskets. The development of gunpowder weapons had a huge effect on the whole of warfare. Uh, it meant that armour was really going to disappear. It meant that although hand-to-hand -hand fighting would continue uh, and swords were going to be used even by infantry for a bit afterwards and by cavalry for quite a long time afterwards, actually most of the damage was going to be done um, by bullets. So once gunpowder has brought its noisy, bad egg stink fury to the battlefield, the days of the sword are numbered. From ancient times to Hollywood, the sword has represented power, justice, and the fight against evil. It's both magical and deadly. The sword has influenced the outcome of great moments in the past inspired famous myths and legends, and the skill of its makers has turned it into an object of desire. Books on the subject of warfare became available. These volumes by Italian writer Ridolfo Capofero allowed gentlemen to study and collect items surrounding their interest in the sword. The sword was becoming an academic pursuit. These graphic images are quite shocking. They don't hold back on the effects of sword fighting, but they also show a new kind of sword, the rapier, designed for a lethal thrust. These new swords were fast, light, and well-balanced. This was a new style of fighting, not just for soldiers, but for civilians too. 
These illustrations are part of a collection owned by Malcolm Fair, editor of Sword magazine and owner of the British National Fencing Museum near Malvern. A former British junior fencing champion, Malcolm is also a veteran Commonwealth title holder. His collection focuses on the non-military use of the sword. Civilians are first depicted in paintings in Spain wearing swords. That uh, quickly spread to Italy, and the Italian Renaissance and the artists available there led fencing masters to produce beautifully illustrated works. And those masters uh, spread across Europe, teaching young men in all countries the principles of rapier fencing. This book by Dutchman Gerard Thibault, published in 1628, illustrates and analyzes sword moves. The Academy of the Sword is a monumental life's work by one of Europe's renowned swordsmen. Thibault produced a massive catalogue of techniques and insights intended for use by students without access to an instructor. Thibaut himself was an enthusiast of the Spanish rapier. Its long, narrow blade produced the perfect straight line used to intercept an opponent's weapon. Thibaut's book examined posture and movement and encouraged the use of intelligence in defeating an opponent. It was the essential accessory for the young man about town. Despite Gerard Thibault's ideals, the popularity of the rapier also brought about its notoriety. It became the weapon of first resort in settling disputes on the street. But if Hollywood is to be believed, it was also a way of settling them on the high seas. Captain Henry Morgan was the inspiration for this Hollywood version of his life in 1935, starring Errol Flynn in the role of Captain Blood. His flamboyant style suited the rapier. Swords, not pistols, provided pirate films with most of their devil-may-care action. Then I'll take her when you're dead. The real rapier had a lethal blade and developed a decorative guard that bordered on the ornamental. Originally, it was exceptionally long, and rapiers posed a danger to passers-by. Visitors entering London had either to hand in their swords at the city gates or have them cut down to size, which is where the expression comes from. No longer were people using swords which had been designed primarily for use on the battlefield. This was a sword worn by definition by a gentleman, but worn by somebody who'd expect to use it against a similarly armed opponent. And it begins the departure of the sword from a purely military weapon to a weapon which was a badge of social status and a way of settling quarrels between people of a similar background. Europe's aristocrats and moneyed classes went dueling mad. In one year in Italy, there were 300 deaths from dueling. Typically, out of any hundred duelists, a third would be from the military, a third from literary and artistic circles, and the remainder from other walks of life. At the court of Louis XIV, uh, fashions changed, and there was a need for a smaller court sword. This is the sort of sword that evolved with a hollow ground, triangular blade, a very sharp point, and it could be manipulated much more easily than a rapier, and consequently it was much more dangerous. Men fought at the slightest provocation at any time of the day or night, by moonlight or torchlight, in the street or behind closed doors. If you wanted to defend your honor, you needed to have some skill, especially if you had no military training. Swordmasters established themselves in salons and taught self-defense. <laughs> 
expert duelists were soon committing crimes, confident that they could defeat their opponents or rivals in trial by combat. Social reformers, politicians and even senior military figures began to view all duels as a social evil. Despite the anxiety, the madness for dueling continued. If you were a gentleman in the 18th century, you needed to learn how to shoot a pistol and you needed to learn how to fence because you were quite likely either to be challenged to a duel or to be put in circumstances where you'd have to challenge somebody else. And you needed to be able to use a gentleman's weapons, sword and pistol. So learning to fence was really very important because as a gentleman, throughout the 18th century, you'd wear, um, under almost all circumstances, a weapon called a small sword which is a really a reduced weapon of the rapier, you'd wear that, swing at your left hip, and you'd be expected to know how to use it. And wearing the thing and not knowing how to use it was going to get you into dead trouble. In the absence of adequate laws or a police force, the duel delivered a kind of rough justice that prevailed throughout the century. In military circles, there was a new sword on the block the sabre. Developed for use by the cavalry, it was curved and based on designs from the east. The sorts of sword that you needed for fighting on foot and the sorts that you needed for fighting on horseback were really quite different. Uh, a man on horseback needs a sword which is going to give him reach. He'll want to reach out over the horse's neck on one side or on the other. And he might want to use it as one horseman against another, perhaps to stab with a straight arm, or he might want to use it against infantry who are running if he's pursuing them, to give a cut. But in both cases, he needs a weapon that's longer and probably heavier than would be used by a man on foot. In the first decade of the 19th century, the Emperor Napoleon had turned the French army against every major European power. But a coalition of forces defeated Napoleon at Leipzig and exiled him to the island of Elba. In 1815, he escaped from imprisonment and reformed his army with astonishing success his enemies. His army were veterans of earlier campaigns, which included a formidable cavalry. Napoleon was determined to defeat the Allies in what is now Belgium as a first step to rebuilding his empire. The French faced an army of mixed nationality, a British, Dutch and German army of 80,000 troops under the command of the Duke of Wellington were to oppose Napoleon at Waterloo. The Allies were, in the words of Wellington, an infamous army. The scum of the earth. Weak and ill-equipped with a very inexperienced staff. The battlefield lies just outside of Brussels and has hardly changed since the armies fought each other on June the 18th, 1815. One of the first attacks was made by the French heavy cavalry. Surgeon and historian Mick Crumplin has made a study of sword injuries at Waterloo. I think the two basic uh, types of injury that can be caused by a weapon are those caused by a sharp pointed uh, end and that caused by the downward sweep and the slashing effect of uh, a sabre such as this. But of course if the slash comes to the neck in a horizontal way with a full kinetic energy through the blade of the slashing weapon, it'll decapitate in one go. Or if an artery is sliced in the neck or in a limb, uh, as a limb is almost severed, uh, that can cause fairly instantaneous death from bleeding. 
the British cavalry were led by Lord Uxbridge, who famously lost his leg in the battle, but continued to direct his troops. They faced Napoleon's heavily armored cavalry. A thrusting weapon such as this French cuirassier sword with its long blade, and if you reach down from a horse with this, you can reach down a long way towards your opponent, and should it pass through just muscle or skin, it's not going to do much harm, particularly in the heat of battle, it might be barely noticed. But if that point were to pass through the chest and the heart and the lungs, uh, there would be fairly instantaneous death. During the Napoleonic Wars, British cavalry used the 1796 pattern sword. For light cavalry, it was curved and heavy, and it was a vicious sword. It was like a meat cleaver. It could lop off arms and ears and that sort of thing. It was very unpopular with the French. The French surgeons were com uh, complaining about the terrible slicing uh, injuries caused by this particular sword, which was a very effective disabling weapon and it produced the most horrific injuries. These paintings were made by the surgeon and artist Sir Charles Bell, who attended the wounded on the day of battle. The French cavalry sword, which tended to be straight, didn't inflict such dramatic wounds, but just a couple of inches of the point anywhere in the body was enough to kill whereas the 1796 pattern light cavalry used by the British inflicted lots of terrible wounds but killed people comparatively rarely. So one looked awful, the other did the business relatively simply. Infection was probably less likely with sword wounds generally than with gunshot wounds. Swords can cleave in a bit of hair, skin and helmet or leather helmet and that can take bacteria into the bone through the dura mater which is a membrane covering the brain which has a sort of very fluid like consistency in health and if those bits of debris with bacteria ca are carried in by the sword that's often what will finish you. <laughs> There were many brave actions on the day. Sergeant Charles Ewart of the Scots Greys described how he took an eagle standard off the French. I had a hard contest for it. The enemy made a thrust at my groin. I parried it and cut him down through the head. After this, a foot soldier fired at me and charged me with his bayonet. I had the good luck to parry and cut him down through the head. Then a lancer came at me. I cut him through the chin, upwards, through the teeth. Thus ended the contest. The battle like Waterloo, principally they used swords against one another. Uh, and what you would get then, sort of slightly oddly in the middle of a 19th century smoky battlefield, would be cavalrymen going at it, hammer and tongs, and one Eyewitness said that it sounded like a, a thousand coppersmiths at work. The sound of sword on sword and sword on metal breastplate. The French attacked in large formations when they assumed the British lines had broken, only to find stiff resistance that decimated their cavalry. In the end, Napoleon's fate was sealed when the Prussian army relieved the beleaguered British troops on the evening of June the 18th. Over 40,000 soldiers lay dead or wounded on the field after 10 hours of fighting. Thousands of bodies were stripped by looters during the night. Though the French had lost the battle overall, their cavalry with its straighter stabbing sword was more effective at killing the enemy. This was the style of sword the British army would use in future. It came into play most famously during the Crimean War against the Russians. Outside military circles, things were changing fast. By the mid-19th century, breeches had been replaced by trousers in civilian life, and carrying swords in public went out of fashion. <laughs> 
Tailored suits became the normal day wear of men, and dueling for gents faded along with the need to display swords in the street. But the sword continued behind closed doors. It was still a way by which young men showed courage and honour. At least, that's what they claimed in Germany. The Mensa was, and still is, practised in the older universities. A duelling scar became a badge of honour, a rite of passage for students, and a nod to their ancestors who might have used the sword in a life-and-death struggle. German sword-fighting instructor Alex Kiermeier explains the background of the Mensa tradition. Don't worry. Die Mensur entstand eigentlich aus dem Bedürfnis heraus, sich zu duellieren. The Mensur grew out of the dueling tradition. It was meant to deal with matters of honor. Then it developed into a practice where you had to discipline yourself, but where you still had an opportunity to prove your courage to your friends. für seine Studentenverbindung beweisen musste. Ja, ich denke, viele Leute Many people who fight in the Mensur nowadays have a kind of macho approach and they want to show how tough they are. But it's really about making a stand and having a commitment to your club. In Germany today, many people have negative feelings about the Mensur. Many people think that the Mensur and its followers are associated with extreme right-wing politics, but that isn't necessarily the case. If you participate in Mensur, you need the Schlager. Its sharp, pointed tip is used to deliver a cut which would give you a desirable scar. Or worse. The Mensur has a whole ritual surrounding it with its own societies and it's considered rather exclusive in places like Heidelberg University. By the last quarter of the 19th century, the sword became exploited by the world of advertising in a mind-boggling range of promotional activities. Even the world of soft porn saw the attraction of its phallic form. This American ad for a farmer's bank must have been the Pirelli calendar of its time. The magic lantern was replaced by early film at the dawn of the 20th century. Recreation and sports became more widespread among all classes and sexes. And this is an early attempt to fight the women's cause. It seems that the woman has outfenced the soldier and he's trying to make excuses to his buddies. He must have been blinded by the moonlight or something. And if that didn't get him, the First World War would. The military still clung to swords. Tradition demanded it. The old guard were convinced that there was still a role for the cavalry in 20th century warfare. When the First World War began, there were over half a million horses in military service. Cavalry charges were planned, but few were carried out amongst the bomb craters and barbed wire and no man's land. During the 19th century, the British Army was really unable to make its mind up as to whether swords were best used for cutting or thrusting. So it produced a series of patterns of what were called cut and thrust swords lightly curved blade with a reasonable point, which you could use for both. Uh, eventually, at the very beginning of the 20th century, the British Army decided that the most effective way of fighting with the sword was to thrust. And so it produced its last ever cavalry sword, the 1908 pattern, which was arguably the perfect sword. It had a big bowl guard, a pistol grip, so that you'd line it up naturally, and a straight slim blade, perfect for thrusting. The perfect weapon produced at exactly the moment that cavalry was leaving the battlefield forever. After four years of fighting and 20 million deaths, Europe was traumatized. By 1918, the world was ready for a good dose of escapism. <laughs> 
While tanks and machine guns made the old ways of warfare obsolete, swordsmen continued to flail away at villains. These were the new swashbuckling heroes of a thousand exciting films, like this silent movie. It's based on the Three Musketeers. Almost all swashbuckling films were based on great stories from the past. Many screenwriters adapted 19th century romances and heroic tales, which were often based on ancient myths and legends. They featured men in tights, capable of daring feats and righting wrongs. Embraced by their one true love, these characters strode across the screen with a rapier or broadsword. Robin Hood was always a favorite. For physical movement and a certain visual style, Douglas Fairbanks Sr. was the finest of his generation. In his version of Robin Hood, he showed that the sword was the ideal symbol of justice. The sword was perfectly suited to the free spirit of this cinematic hero and acrobatic champion of the poor. Fairbanks' athletic prowess and dashing good looks made him the king of Hollywood. This version of Robin Hood was made in 1922. It was one of the most expensive films of the times with a $1 million budget. The film broke all box office records and netted a 500% profit for Fairbanks. Sound on feature films was achieved in 1927. By the 30s, the talkies were a global phenomenon and helped secure Hollywood's position as one of the world's most powerful and popular institutions. With the coming of color, older stories were remade. Robin Hood was ripe for a makeover, this time with Errol Flynn in 1938. Once again, the film shows the aristocrat turned outlaw pitted against the Normans and the arch villain the sheriff of Nottingham. Now, this forest is wide. It can shelter and clothe and feed a band of good, determined men, good swordsmen, good archers, good fighters. Are you with me? The sword fights in this film are amongst the best from Hollywood, and they symbolize the struggle against dark forces. The sword symbolically represents the gentlemanly status of the person who bears it. It has often religious overtones, that's not simply in Christianity but in other religions as well. And it also often represents justice against evil. Um, not for nothing does the figure of justice with the scales in one hand have a sword in the other. So in a sense, this classic, simple, cross-hilted sword represents, amongst other things, pure, double-edged justice. World War II has often been called a just war. The Americans produced a number of propaganda-led racist films against the Japanese, but the Japanese did execute prisoners by beheading. Some of their victims were of European descent, but the Japanese treated their Chinese and Korean neighbors as if they were subhuman. Thousands of these Asians were executed by the sword with the blessing of Emperor Hirohito and his generals. In Europe, there was conflict too. The Germans used swords and daggers for ceremonial purposes. Many of these were based on imperial Roman styles. The Nazis were always looking for stories or symbols which linked them to, as they saw it, a glorious past. Many of the daggers were made in the town of Solingen, famous in medieval times for the finest broadswords. In 1945, Hitler was defeated. As the Second World War ended and society stabilized, new theatrical productions were made for radio and cinema. These were mimicked by children at play and reflected the actions of their heroes. In the movies, the sword was a central prop in many epic films, including Alexander the Great starring Richard Burton. The film was made in 1956. Alexander, conqueror of conquerors, whose ambition knew no bounds. 
It's the story of how Alexander united the Greeks against the Persian Empire and how he went on to conquer all before him with sword in hand. A new generation of Hollywood swashbuckling actors have joined the ranks of the famous names of the past. Johan Griffith, star of Horatio Hornblower, and the Fantastic Four has also played one of the great mythic heroes of the past. My latest uh, part playing uh, a character that needed a sword was uh, Lancelot in King Arthur. And there I got to brandish two swords uh, on, on the back of the horse, uh, which made for a very sort of uh, sexy unsheathing of those swords. They were sort of on a leather satchel on my back. And you know, when you unsheathed them there, there was a, sort of a, a sexy moment and a very sort of defining moment for the character. Well, it looks uh, incredibly real when you see it on film. So when we are actually working together, because it is work, it's not sort of pretending. We are, you know, going for direct hits that we've choreographed very carefully. You'd start very slowly and deliberately. You know, I go here, you go there, and this happens and st until it starts to instill itself in your muscles and in your muscle memory. Matthew Rees is another Hollywood actor who knows about the risks of stage fighting from playing several leading Shakespearean roles. Part of the excitement or the adrenaline for me is knowing that if something does go wrong, a large element of yourself is responsible for getting yourself out of it, either defending or parrying or making sure you don't get hurt. But one can cheat the, uh, the idea that we, I am actually trying to cut your head off with an intention rather than actually physically going for somebody's head. The culture these days is gun associated and as, I, as my f fighting teacher always, always said that, um, you know any, anyone can pull a trigger but the sword itself is, a, is an extension of you it's an, basically an, an extension of your arm therefore it's really only your your skill that in, in its purest form that you know differentiates life and death it's down to you one of the biggest films that shows life and death struggles was produced in 1960. Many of the sword fighting scenes directed by Stanley Kubrick were cut from the final release prints because at the time they were thought too gory for the audience. Starring Kirk Douglas as Spartacus, slave, gladiator, invincible fighter. The film won four Oscars at that year's Academy Award ceremony. A fitting tribute, as the Oscar statuette actually holds a historic sword in his hands. In the 1950s and 60s, children's matinees nourished the next generation of cinema goers. Some of the films they saw ended up on television, and the sword and its heroes continued to enthrall boys and girls of all ages. One of the biggest and most successful characters was Zorro. The story of Zorro is set in old Spanish California, where the hero fights for the ordinary people against a tyrannical governor. Zorro uses a short rapier, similar in style to the weapon found in many fencing academies today. Leon Paul is Britain's biggest and oldest sword fencing manufacturer. The company, which was established in London by Frenchman Leon Paul in 1925, has an international reputation. Paul began as a fencing master and soon after started to produce his own equipment. The firm developed and built their own forges, presses, welders, and molding equipment. One of the most innovative machines is this hot metal forger. The steel billet is cut to conform to the desired sword shape, and the forge can be adapted to suit a variety of templates. The grandson of the founder is Barry Paul, the current chief executive of the company. He's a former British foil champion and Olympic fencer and understands the virtues of keeping everything in-house. 
And of course, manufacturing yourself gives a huge advantage of flexibility. You can make new things, try new things. One of the uh, advantages of being able to make uh, all our equipment here is that when uh, film directors ask for a special equipment to be made, uh, we can make it and normally produce something within days, if not hours. And in fact, um, James Bond died another day. We were there um, supplying kit for the various fences. A special kit was uh, needed. James Bond wants a left-handed one of those, or uh, the villain needs something in black or something. And so it's a great advantage being able to make stuff yourself. The founder, Leon Paul, was in demand as a stage fight director. He taught film actors after the Second World War, since when his grandsons have followed in his footsteps. The costume, essential to the sport, is also made here. Face masks, invented by the French in the late 18th century to accompany the training sword, made the sport safer, especially for instructors who had to engage with students of mixed ability. It wasn't unknown for a sword master to lose an eye while teaching a novice. Nowadays, masks are obligatory and injuries are rare. The speed of modern fencing used to make judging hits difficult. Electrification of the sword began in the 1930s and took 50 years to be fully effective in all categories. A cable is attached to a telescopic tip and illuminates a light when a hit is made. The company supplied and sponsored the American and British teams at the last Olympic Games. Since the modern games were introduced in 1896, fencing has been one of the few sports to be included at every event since that date. Traditionally, the sport has been dominated by the Europeans. Currently, the most successful nation is France, with Italy and Germany close behind. But the Americans and Chinese are catching up. Fencing clubs provide training in various types of sword. The épée has a three-sided blade. It's a descendant of the dueling sword and is used in thrusting. Its target area is the whole body. So, what qualities do you need in this game? World-class fencers are selfish, uh, determined, aggressive, intelligent. The Olympic fencers probably take 10 years to create. The fencing sabre is the heavier sword. Scoring is achieved by both cutting and thrusting actions to the upper body, arms and head. It is said that the point of a fencing weapon is the second fastest object in sport after a bullet. The scoring lights help the judges, but they have an effect on the action too. Electrification changed the emphasis from making an attack so that judges could see your point arriving to hitting anywhere on the valid target provided the electrical apparatus registered the hit. Speed, not power, gets results, especially for the foil, a favorite with beginners. Though it's a regular competition sword too, it's a thrusting weapon and hits are scored by striking the torso. Swords have also entered the world of reenactment and lifestyle. The Knights Gone By store in North Wales sells replica swords from all periods for use by collectors and those who enjoy what's called living history. People of all ages who use weapons and costumes to transform themselves into knights or pirates or Romans. Here the sword appeals to historians and fantasy enthusiasts alike. For those who want to connect with the spiritual roots of sword fighting, there's kendo. This is Akai Ryu, Red Dragon Club in South Wales. Kendo means the way of the sword. It's a comparatively modern Japanese martial art and aims to mold the mind and body and to cultivate a vigorous spirit. Originally, samurai warriors used the sword to kill people. 
However, the Edo period of the 17th century was a more peaceful time. It was then that the practice of kendo was developed. The idea was not to kill people, but to educate them. There are many elements to kendo. An honest heart is most important. We can easily build up a strong body, but it is difficult to build up a true and honest heart. With a good heart, you can be open to many things and see many things. To some Europeans, spiritual matters can feel out of reach. In Kendo, spirit is important. Breathing, willpower, and spirit are all connected in Kendo. We use these things to discipline ourselves, and we try to raise the quality of Kendo for ourselves and our opponents. The inspiration for this activity is the samurai warrior. So how is the katana blade regarded by kendo experts? Originally, the katana sword was a symbol with a godlike status. It was not just a cutting weapon. The katana is still a noble and holy sword. Kendo is shout to express their fighting spirit when striking, something which is rooted in Japanese martial culture. But for some, the sword can have a very different interpretation. The ceremonies and rituals which form part of the Royal Nationalist Edward of Wales are a rich mixture of tradition and imagination created by Yolo Morganug, the founder of the ancient Druidic Order of Britain. The sword in these ceremonies is a potent symbol of peace. The sheath of the great ceremonial sword is inscribed with words that emphasize its peaceful purpose. Its hilt is decorated with a dragon of Wales and a natural crystal to represent mysticism. At the climax of the ceremony in which a poet is honored, the great sword is raised, and in response to the question, is there peace, the audience shout, peace. The sword ritual was a part of Yolo's Godsed from the beginning in 1792. But it wasn't a sword in the sense of a weapon, but a sword that symbolized the fact that the poets of the Godsev circle were a peaceful fellowship. The sword is never fully unsheathed and is not held by the hilt. This is not a sword meant for killing people. In military circles, the sword no longer has a role as a weapon, but is used symbolically to represent rank and power. Wilkinson's sword was one of the largest suppliers of swords to the armed services. They were particularly skilled at making decorative officers' swords. Officers got their uniforms from their regimental military tailor and they provided, offered the gen young gentleman the sword and they were known to be you know, not of the highest quality. They could easily bend or break when they were used and this annoyed Henry Wilkinson so much that that's why he embarked on the venture to make Britain the makers of the finest swords in the world. For 200 years, the company supplied all ranks with cold steel. But with a reduction in the size of armed services in recent years, Wilkinson's changed direction. The sword part of the business was sold off. Sword hilts are covered in shark or ray skins, which provide good grip. These traditional techniques have remained part of the production process despite the changes in company ownership. 
the German company WKC, based in Solingen, a traditional sword-making area, bought some of the equipment from Wilkinson, but the British firm Pooley Swords also acquired many of the drawings, records and machinery. Pooleys sent the heavy equipment out to India for the forging of blades. India was for hundreds of years renowned for the quality of its metalwork and weapons. All the new generation swords are made from carbon steel. Then they're sent to England for finishing and assembly. The British armed services, as well as overseas defense forces, still place orders for new swords. But pulleys also provide an important restoration and repair service. Etched blades usually carry the defining insignia of a regiment and confirm the sword as a ceremonial weapon. Pooley supply swords to the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, where the leadership qualities demanded of an officer are taught to cadets. Swords are the main feature of the Sovereign's Parade, where these young men are finally commissioned into the army. The overseas sword is awarded to the best foreign cadet, and the Sword of Honor is awarded to the most outstanding cadet of his intake. History is a source of pride to armies, and swords provide some continuity with the past. But there are also swords for kings and queens. This sword was made to commemorate the coronation of the British Queen, Elizabeth II, in 1953. The sword is in the style of an épée, decorated with precious stones. The most futuristic take on swords was created in cinema's Star Wars series. It introduced lightsabers to the world and still inspires fans who want to save the universe, like these backstreet heroes. Despite Star Wars being the most technical tour de force on screen, when it comes down to saving the universe, it's flashing blades and a sword in hand that the filmmakers chose. Throughout human history, edged weapons have enabled us to hunt and to defend ourselves. From the Stone Age, with its flint knives, to the First Age of metals and the earlier swords, our ancestors have fought and made blades that enabled great civilizations to succeed. The seeds of that success have also produced the dark side of human activity. But where there are villains, there are heroes. Ancient myths and legends have sent us sword-wielding saviors to protect us from evil. The sword story constantly throws up episodes in which religious or political conflicts have tested our metal. The 13th century was a high mark for the sword, since when it's fought for its place at the great events that determined our future. Civil wars and revolutions have seen its bloody contribution, but it's also been exploited by artists and writers and been turned into a sport fit for kings and emperors. Horses gave swords a place on the battlefield, but with the coming of the 20th century and military mechanization, swords had to find an alternative role. Adventure stories and popular cinema provided it and inspired new generations of young blades to test their courage. The sword has symbolized the fight against evil, so it's no wonder that most societies have celebrated the perfect sword. From ancient times to Hollywood, the sword has represented power, justice, and the fight against evil. It's both magical and deadly.
The sword has influenced the outcome of great moments in history, inspired famous myths and legends, and the skill of its makers has turned it into an object of desire. It's a perfect fusion of form and function, and it has the power to thrill and appall in equal measure. Today, there are many reminders of our sword fighting past. A man buttons his coat left over right, leaving his right hand free to draw his sword. We shake hands to show we're not armed. A gentleman escorts a lady by the right arm because his sword hangs on his left. With the touch of a sword, a man is knighted. With the breaking of his own, he is disgraced. Whole armies were surrendered by the giving up of a single sword. And swords have been ritually sacrificed to the gods in order to invoke their protection. Compared to many wild animals, we're defenseless creatures. So from the earliest times, we've had to make weapons that cut and pierce in order to hunt, to eat, and for defense against enemies. The first weapons were made of flint, honed by flaking, using antler or bone to create a good cutting edge. The first known metal was gold, but it's always been precious and usually belonged to royalty. The first metal to be used for making tools and weapons was discovered 6,000 years ago. That was copper. This is the great Orm copper mine in North Wales. It was one of the largest industrial centres of antiquity. Around 3,500 years ago, copper was exported from here to Northern Europe and the Mediterranean. A copper sword was a top of the range weapon, but it had its drawbacks. Copper is soft, but when it's mixed with tin, it becomes bronze. Bronze is three times stronger than copper and is more suitable for casting. This enabled swords of a similar quality to be produced in greater numbers. Those who controlled the production of bronze controlled their territory. In Cornwall, Neil Burridge, an expert bronze caster, has set up a forge in a Celtic roundhouse. He's heating up a mixture of approximately 90% copper and 10% tin to make bronze for a new blade. He makes bronze swords, like this 3,000-year-old example from the Royal Armouries in Leeds. This caster's technique is based on archaeological evidence. Like most sword makers, he judges the metal by eye, and the color of the molten bronze is crucial in deciding when it's ready to pour. It solidifies almost immediately. The famous legend of King Arthur and the sword in the stone may have its roots in this process, where we see the newly cast sword removed from a stone mold. Cooling the metal by quenching it in water also makes it harder and ready for action. The sword, unlike the spear or arrow, is a close range weapon. That's what makes it so special, so personal and so terrible. In much of Northern Europe, the tribal system of fighting put great emphasis on individual bravery, but tactics and a coordinated approach to a battle was seldom adopted. But whatever system of fighting was used, there were still problems with swords. Bronze, though tougher than copper, could still deform in the intensity of a fight. It took hundreds of years for new materials, knowledge and skill to cross the continent. With the discovery and exploitation of iron in 1500 BC in Central Asia, warriors had a harder material with which to make their weapons. The sword was still evolving along with metallurgy. Iron is much more abundant than copper, 
and more widely distributed across the world. It could be forged into much sharper and more lethal weapons. Swords became longer and heavier, but few remain from the early iron period because they're prone to rust. Here's a rare example made in Western Europe. It shows a high level of decoration and may have been made as a gift for a tribal chief. Sword makers were highly regarded. Smiths who made instruments meant to take life and who transformed raw material seemed to have power over nature. So if you manipulated the four elements of earth, air, fire and water, you were empowered by the gods to manipulate a fifth element, magic. A swordsmith often worked in a forge whose entrance was shaped in a spiral to keep the light out. The colours of orange, red and white would be read by the sword maker like a special code. The blacksmith would work from these colours and he would work so that nobody could see what he was doing because he would be blocking it out. The only person that would have these secrets would be his son or his apprentice and they would be passed on and jealously guarded. Swords were thought to have spiritual powers beyond their earthly use and even went on to the afterlife. They were often buried with their owners in special places. There are many examples of Celtic graves where the warriors are dug up with their blades folded so that they can't be used, but if in the other world they needed them, the warriors could always unbend them. The sword was bent so that a mere mortal couldn't use it. The Celts invoked the power of lake goddesses to assist them in battle by giving up their swords as sacrificial offerings. When the Romans invaded Britain in 43 AD, they didn't underestimate the influence of the spirit world on their enemy. The strength and power of iron was exploited by the Romans more successfully than any other civilization. The Romans used new ideas and technologies to such advantage that they dominated the known world for centuries. The real essence of Roman success was discipline and collective skills. I mean, the Roman legionary fought as part of a team. He fought as part of a team which was well organised in tactical terms and had also got great logistic backup. I mean, he was a soldier rather than an individual warrior. And around the middle of the first century AD, the Roman soldier was to benefit from two significant changes in equipment. Bands of plate armor with mail and a sturdier cut and thrust sword made from steel. Both were very effective against their enemies. Romans trained hard. They even practiced with wooden swords, something that their dangerous entertainers, the gladiators, used to do. Here's some rarely seen footage of Hollywood actor Kirk Douglas in rehearsal for the epic film Spartacus, the story of a rebel gladiator. A motion picture unequaled in the entire history of filmmaking, unlikely ever to be surpassed. Slave, gladiator, invincible... Fighter. This film inspired Sue Shadrach, who's now an expert on gladiators. The whole word gladiator comes from the name for the sword. This is a gladius. Every gladiator takes their name from the, the primary weapon that they use. Gladiators have always pulled in the crowds. They were better trained than the average soldier. They were expensive, super pros, and some of their training was adopted by the Roman army. There are even accounts of female fighters. There were female gladiators, and they were by no means as common as the male variety. A novelty. And I think that because it was so shocking, it was a difficult thing for people to take in. But we have records of high-born women who chose to go into the arena. When we hear about these people, we've got to remember these women were the exception, very much the exception. Ugh! <sighs> 
In total, the Roman army had 30 legions of 5,000 men each. They also had as many auxiliary troops recruited from the subjects of the empire. With this, they conquered so many nations. So this was the thing that brought them their riches, their fame, their reputation, and it's always been the weapon that's defined Rome itself. When Emperor Claudius invaded Britain, he brought 40,000 troops with him, 15% of the entire army, and it took 20 difficult years to defeat the natives. The accounts of the terrifying fighting methods of the Celts were written up by the Roman scribe Tacitus. Each Briton behaved according to his character. Unarmed men were prepared to charge to certain death. Even the vanquished now and then recovered their fury and their courage. In their desperate plight, the enemy would show such bravery that when their front ranks had fallen, those immediately behind would stand on their bodies and continue to fight. This is Tacitus talking up the Celts to make the Romans look good. Despite the propaganda, there is no doubting the Celts' willingness to fight. But the Celts had to face the best sword in the business. The Romans adopted what really became the classic infantry short sword, double-edged, designed to be used by a partially armoured man fighting in rank and file. He didn't want to swing it very far, and ideally the Roman legionary was going to use it in combination with a, an oblong shield covering his left side, and he'd use it for the thrust. Uh, and some Roman swords have got specially hardened tips designed to cope with the opponents of Rome. A very, very effective fighting sword. Most of the Roman army were infantry. They used chariots for ceremonial and sporting events. Cavalry were only used for reconnaissance and harassing fleeing enemy soldiers. Mounted Roman troops didn't use stirrups, but that was to change. In 378 AD, two-thirds of the Eastern Roman army was wiped out by the Visigoths, who used the stirrup and massed cavalry charges. The introduction of the stirrup, which came in gradually from the east, made it easier for the very heavily armoured and equipped horseman to use his horse as a battle platform, with his feet thrust deeply into stirrups, um, riding with almost a straight leg and sitting in a, a great big chair-like saddle. There he was, secure in the saddle, and able to use a variety of heavy swords and battle axes and war hammers, um, really comparatively securely. So from that point of view, the stirrup and the heavy sword went hand in hand. The Romans in Britain moved out to defend their territory in the east. Their western provinces then became vulnerable. Germanic and Scandinavian tribes invaded Britain. Jutes, Angles and Saxons settled amongst the newly Christianized British and overran most of the native population. These pagan invaders had to be resisted and one of the greatest heroes of all time was created. Arthur, the once and future king, a figure that was part historical, part mythological. In the 12th century, Geoffrey of Monmouth took hold of the original Welsh myth and combined it with his own imagination to create a best-selling Latin text, The History of the Kings of Britain. The story spread into the French-speaking world, making Arthur and his knights the stuff of the European imagination, even rivaling heroes like Charlemagne. The early Celtic themes, such as the story in which Arthur proves his rightful succession as king by drawing the sword from the stone, are woven into the continental stories. Later English authors claimed that the sword from the stone was broken in combat by a Welsh knight, Pelinor. Arthur was saved from certain death by Merlin, who cast a spell on Pelinor. Soon after, Arthur, who had a regard for Pelinor's sword-fighting skills, invited him to join the famous Round Table. Then Merlin took Arthur to a secret place, 
where the Lady of the Lake magically presented him with a new sword. Arthur was told that his future would be bound to the sword for all the days of his life. This was Excalibur. Arthur was mortally wounded after the Battle of Camelon, and he instructed Sir Bedivere to return Excalibur to the lake. Bedivere was unable to part with the sword, fearing what the future held without Arthur and Excalibur. On the third attempt, he obeyed Arthur's wish and relinquished the sword. Excalibur is a classic example of the way that swords um, were used in myth and legend. The idea of a sword belonging to the once and future king uh, the idea of a sword which was not only important in that king's lifetime but had, in a sense, to be committed back to whence it came. I think that's a very resonant idea, that, that the sword wasn't left behind after the great man had gone. The sword went after him so that when he reappeared in a time of great need, he'd have the mighty sword to hand. In the late 8th century, there was a new threat from the north. Vikings began to raid the coast of Britain and Western Europe. For the Viking, the sword was the principal weapon. Its value was considered so great that it was handed down from father to son. If the sword was old or belonged to a famous warrior from the past, then it would have even greater value. Magnus Sigurdsson, a swordsmith based in North Wales, makes historical weapons and knows about the qualities needed in a good blade. Steel is either hard and breaks or soft and bends. A sword actually needs to be hard to keep a good working edge. It also needs to be soft and pliable to actually take the shock of combat and sort of parrying and actually the physical force of a blow. So a sword is a contradiction in terms <laughs> speaking in metal, which is why they were all so expensive and such hard work to make. Magnus is going to compare a Viking type of sword with one from the Bronze Age. We'll see how much difference over a thousand years of technological development has made to the cutting power of the weapons. The first to be tested is the Bronze Sword. This is 3,000 year old technology. Magnus is testing the sword on the carcass of a heifer. That's a nasty eight centimeters cut but it's not very deep. What we have here is a Viking style sword, 8th, 9th century, but the blade design carried on to the 13th, 14th century, primarily a slashing weapon. Thank you. The carcass is almost cut in two, proof that swords made from steel are more devastatingly effective than those made from earlier materials. Vikings revered their swords and gave them names like Grammar, Fierce One, Miofen, Decorated One, Fatbeater, Biter of Legs. The Norsemen of northern France, the Normans, invaded England in 1066. Their Viking style swords were pattern welded from soft iron twisted with steel to make them both strong and flexible. The Normans took control of England and Wales. Within a hundred years, a new sword culture developed, one based on romantic notions. Inspired by the legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, the sword's status was enhanced by the development of the chivalric code, a guide to acting with courage and honor, which united knights across Europe. In the Middle Ages, the sword became particularly associated with the knight. Its Christian symbolism was also quite obvious. Uh, and the gesture of saluting by bringing the sword hilt to your lips, which is still done, really is a reflection of the age when the sword wasn't simply a knightly symbol, but reflected Christianity as well. The Crusades were seen as the pursuit of a pure ideal. They identified the knight as a virtuous champion, one who was destined to fight in wars as a soldier of the church. The Crusades were also a battle between the cross-shaped broadsword of Christianity and the crescent-shaped scimitar of Islam. The Royal Armouries in Leeds has one of the finest sword collections in the world. 
It is the guardian of the British National Collection of Arms and Armour, and the museum is dedicated to the display and interpretation of military objects. The Royal Armoury also celebrates innovative design, fine craftsmanship and advances in technology. Medieval smiths saw the transition from chainmail to plate armour as a response to developments in infantry weapons, such as mail-piercing arrows. Shields, too, were gradually made redundant by full armour and began to disappear from the battlefield, at least for knights. By the late 14th century, a technical rivalry was developing between swordsmiths and armourers. Armour impacts on sword design just as the sword impacts on armour. Uh, but what happens is that you have that classic two-way relationship between attack and defence. Um, to start with, um, chain armour or reinforced leather armour was widely used and that could often be penetrated by a sharp point which essentially wedged open the links in the uh, armourers responded by plate armour which was more difficult to penetrate so swords got heavier and swordsmiths looked at producing robust blades with edges that might be able to work at places like the shoulders so armour got heavier so there's this two-way relationship with swordsmiths always thinking about getting through armour and armourers always looking at ways of defeating first the point and then the edge by the 15th century, plate armour was impressive to look at, but what was it like in action? At the Royal Armouries, there are international jousting events that put it to the test. Tournaments began as contests between teams of knights. Though there were casualties, the idea was not to spill much blood. It was meant to provide additional training for a knight, but the stakes were high. Knights on the losing side were taken as prisoners and ransomed. Fortunes could be made in this way. After jousting, knights would often continue fighting on foot. They used 200 great swords. At tournaments, a fixed number of blows would be agreed beforehand and knights would take it in turns to hit their opponent. The sword was used as a virtual club. On the battlefield, the two-handed sword was used to smash through armor. It looked heavier than it was, but nevertheless, it required considerable skill in action. Just how great a risk an armoured knight faced is answered by Dutchman Arne Koitz, who wears a mighty eagle helm in tournaments. Even if the visor is shut, you would try and stab through there with the sword, because it's a very big inroad into the brain. If the visor is open, so a knight can see more, then of course you have a bigger target. Depending on the type of helmet, the risk might be the front of the throat or the side of the neck. The armpits are very important. They are a main target. There's chainmail under there, but with a good thrust you can get through the mail and get into the lungs and the heart and other body parts. Ease of movement must be a problem. Plate armour does actually allow you a lot of movement. For example, you can raise your hands right up there. I can actually touch the far side of my head and I can bring my arms right across. There are all sorts of moves you might use with a sword too. The waist is actually made so that I can make a lot of movement like this. I can actually lunge with all this armour. The plates will fold and they'll concertina to allow me to do this. The sabre turns on the feet, the knees, everything is articulated, even the top of the legs. This is to enable me to raise them because the movements involved are vital. Face to face with the enemy was no picnic. 
What you then had was, in essence, bloody murder. You had two well-trained, heavily armoured men hacking at one another. So we ought not to confuse the knight's chivalrous background with the ghastly nature of what big men with big swords could actually do to one another. Medieval warfare involved butchery on a large scale. The sword was the knight's main weapon, and it caused death from stabbing, bleeding, and infection too. Swords were rarely clean, and contaminated blades probably did as much damage as a sharp point. There are those today who still want to fight like medieval knights. In Hammerstein, North Germany, there's an unique sword fighting event, an international gathering of martial arts enthusiasts who come together to do battle in the style of the early 15th century. The contest is sponsored by Welsh company Knights Gone By. They supply weapons and costume for battle reenactment from all periods, but specialize in the Middle Ages. Some of the action is held at the local leisure centre. These fighters are using steel swords and small shields called bucklers. This is a competition, not a demonstration. This is tough stuff, but there have to be some safeguards. There was a level of risk tolerance and injury tolerance back then that we simply can't accept uh, nowadays. And the winner of the match was the one who struck his opponent and trying to inflict a bleeding wound. So when you have a culture that breeds fencers who are used to that level of, uh, of intensity of, of competition, um, you're going to see certain skill levels, I think, uh, that we're probably never going to attain. But in terms of getting close, as close as we can, in terms of actually carrying out the techniques in a combative situation and making them work, uh, I think we're getting pretty close to that. Judges are looking for a number of qualities that range from attitude to technique. They're primarily looking to see uh, a swordsman who uh, displays dominance over his opponent. And they're looking for a swordsman who can step in and strike his opponent a clean blow and then escape untouched. There's an old saying from, from fencing, and that it's fencing is the art of touching without being touched. You are so focused on your opponent, watching every little move, planning out what you're going to do next, that there's no time for fear. It's a very delicate balance between being ready to go, ready to really snap into action, but have that under tight control until that exact moment when, bang, you step in and you strike your opponent. The event is partly based at Baron von Hammerstein's castle near Hanover, a gothic and inspirational setting for the contest. The fighters don't have a lot of protection from blows, but then they're not exactly trying to kill each other. When he's not judging at Hammerstein, Alex Kiermaier is chasing villains in Munich. He's a cop, but he's been interested in swords 